Good morning, folks. My name is Jimmy Bashar with the ISS Stakeholder Affairs Group. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the ISS Stakeholder Call to discuss our final 2021 Policy Initiatives Roadmap as part of our annual Policy Initiatives Roadmap process. Of course, thank you for joining today. Uh, given the current events, we appreciate your engagement. Um, as you may know, the ISO creates an annual policy initiative catalog that documents current, potential, and planned policy initiatives. And after finalizing the catalog, which we did earlier this year, the ISO then extracts its three-year roadmap from the final catalog, uh, the first year of which we refer to as our annual plan that solidifies the proposed initiatives the ISO will undergo for the following year. And as mentioned, this call will, of course, discuss the final 2021 roadmap, and so thank you, of course, to those that had submitted feedback on the prior draft roadmap that we held uh, recently. Um, I'm also joined today by James Friedrich from Market and Infrastructure Policy, who is our lead for this roadmap process. I'm also joined by Jill Powers, Brad Cooper, and Greg Cook, also from our policy group. Uh, in our distance, in addition, calls and webinars are recorded for stakeholder convenience allowing those who are unable to attend to listen to recordings after the meetings. The recordings will be publicly available on the ISO webpage for a limited time following the meetings. Of course, the recordings and any related transcriptions uh, should not be reprinted without the ISO's permission. And lastly, of course, if you have any questions, uh, we ask that you please raise your hand virtually by pressing pound two. And we, of course, please request that you state your name and the company that you represent. And with that, I'll hand it over to James. Thanks, Jimmy. So I'll start us off by uh, discussing the primary drivers of this year's uh, policy roadmap. Next slide, please. So we've changed these up a little bit uh, just to make them more clear from our draft roadmap. Um, so our first primary driver is resource sufficiency. Uh, California's resource fleet is rapidly changing in response to our state's climate policy and other market drivers, like the falling cost of renewables and storage. And we're also seeing tightening supply conditions in the West. So given these conditions, the RA program must be reformed to ensure we can meet our net peak demand and energy needs at all times with the RA fleet. We're committed to working with the CPC and other partners to explore reforms needed to our resource adequacy rules and requirements. These reforms include re-looking at things like planning around the net peak load, revisiting the planning reserve margin, looking at ways to better incorporate load and supply uncertainty, and accurately, uh, accurate resource crediting to meet reliability needs. The second primary driver this year is the increased resource and load variability on our system. To address this, we are working towards both enhancing the day ahead market to help address growing uncertainty and variability of net load on our system, and also extending the day ahead market to EIM entities to leverage regional diversity and provide benefits across the West. The final primary driver is new technology. Integrating higher and higher levels of renewable resources will require changes to how the system is managed we are working towards enhancing our market products, modeling, and deliverability to integrate or to make sure they're robust enough to accommodate these changes. And we're also working on enhancing our ability to integrate new technologies such as energy storage and demand management to replace the operational attributes that were previously provided by the thermal fleet, such as flexible capacity and grid services to ensure system and local reliability. Next slide, please. This is a slide that we added from the draft roadmap relating to uh, how the policy team will be uh, focused on policy development related to uh, addressing the issues identified in the preliminary root cause analysis from the summer's uh, heat event. So we're looking to address three themes. Uh, first, our resource adequacy reforms taking place in the current RA enhancements initiative. I touched on some of these elements in the previous slide, 
But in this initiative, we're working towards enhancements that help plan and provide sufficient physical resources to reliably meet load, <clears throat> reliability requirements, and uncertainty in all hours of the year. Second, we are revi revisiting our market scheduling priorities. We're working on mechanisms to ensure demand, that is load and exports, are properly prioritized. The market analysis and forecasting team held an informational workshop last Friday on November 20th to discuss penalty prices and scheduling priorities in our markets. Uh, future workshops and other stakeholder engagement are TBD, uh, but we do have some recent news about stakeholder engagement in that process, and I just ask if Jimmy could give us a quick summary of what those, uh, what those changes are. Yeah, thanks, James. Yeah, for folks that are unaware, we did have a stakeholder call on Friday related to the PRR 1282 in our BPM process. Uh, and for folks who are unaware of what the PRR process is, that's basically the process through which we clarify our business practice manuals uh, regarding any change management issues. And we are making some clarifications, as most are aware, on that issue, as James just mentioned. Um, however, we did have a call to discuss it with a larger stakeholder community, and we are collecting comments on that, which we've decided after the call. Uh, we are currently uh, in the works for announcing that uh, through a market notice. We will be bifurcating them, uh, basically, for those that are associated with the current issues in BPM call. Uh, we'll go to that process, and BPM change management will stay there. And then for any sort of future feedback issues and and, and those types of questions that we receive, we're going to be separating them into a separate uh, initiative page uh, to work out any potential uh, work that we might want to carry forward on that. So uh, for any clarifications or questions, please feel free to contact me, of course, or email the uh, ISO Stakeholder Affairs mailbox at uh, ISO Stakeholder Affairs at TISO.com. So thanks, James. Yeah, thanks, Jimmy. Um, we're also looking at um, scheduling priorities in our day ahead market enhancements initiative. Um, we're expecting a uh, revised draft proposal and will be released in the next few weeks that should uh, propose some enhancements to the rough process to uh, establish and maintain our scheduling priorities. So the third theme uh, that we're looking at is to improve market incentives during tight supply conditions. And so these are uh, three themes or you know, uh, three things that we'll be looking at in uh, our planned scarcity pricing initiative. Uh, the first is to ensure that KAISO can compete for imports during tight supply conditions. The second is to provide greater incentives for accurate load scheduling in the day ahead market. And the third is to provide incentives for virtual resources to better align with operational needs during tight supply conditions. So with that, I will uh, pause for questions on the primary drivers and the roadmap process and also uh, policy development related to the, uh, um, mid or the August heat event. Once again, pressing count two, if you wish to ask a question. I do have a couple questions here. Yolanda, it's been unmuted. Please state your name, company, and question. Hi. Hi, good morning. Uh, this is Aditya from Southern California Edison. Um, actually, I had a overall question regarding a policy initiative that I'm not seeing in the roadmap. Uh, the SCE has uh, consistently asked the KISO about the KISO to market participant relationship enhancement item, which is in the stakeholder catalog. Uh, it, this ended up in the stakeholder catalog because the KISO had indicated that we should put it in there and we haven't seen any movement on it, and neither is it on the roadmap. Could you please shed some light on this? Hello? Yeah, uh, yeah, this is Greg. Sorry, go ahead, Mark. Go ahead, Greg. <laughs> Sorry, dude. We're, we're, you know, we're all we're all virtual, so we normally can't look around the room and see who's good. Yeah. Oh, no way. I was always getting a head nod here. Yeah, yeah. This is Greg Tech. I'll take that one. You know that that's something that you know we've looked at. 
And we didn't put it on the roadmap this year as a specific initiative. You know, I think that's something we're still needing to look at, you know, primarily from a re uh, legal perspective as to what, you know, the proper relationship is between the ISO and its customers. You know, obviously, traditionally, we're, you know, we have that relationship with scheduling coordinators. It's a bit of a, you know, it would be a bit of a change to start having that more direct relationship with the actual um, generators and suppliers. Um, but with that said, you know, I think that's something we can look at as a more more focused initiative. It's not, you know, necessarily what we would view as, you know, it's not a large initiative. It's a barely narrowly scoped uh, item. But, you know, we can, I think that's something that, you know, we can take back and get back to you as to, you know, how we might be able to address that, whether um, it's going to take additional actual tariff changes or if these are things we can do through other means. But, um, uh, you know, we, we are, we have recognized that, that request and, you know, are con continuing to consider how we could address that. Thank you, Greg. So that, that's why I also we're a little bit confused because uh, this, as we had identified too, and the Kaiser had agreed that it wasn't denying its relationships with the market participants and its existing tariff-defined relationships with participating generators. Given that, this enhancement would be basically very low investment in terms of effort and cost. Um, and again, as you mentioned, it may not even require a, a tariff change, which is why we were wondering why it's taking so long to for such a low low effort, high gain item to why would it take so long to to end up in uh, in the roadmap? Yeah, and and I think potentially what, you know, we've been, the the issues we've been having have been concerns being raised primarily from our, our legal department on this. And, you know, perhaps what we should do is, you know, schedule an offline meeting to where, you know, we could have our legal people involved and get, you know, more, have a better understanding of, you know, where uh, Edison's coming from on this and what you would like to see, and at least so we can be, all be, you know, having the same understanding as to, you know, what can be done to, to address the concerns you've raised. Thank you, Greg. That would be much appreciated. Uh, feel free to, you know, reach out to me. I can schedule anything on our end. Uh, so uh, thank you. Okay. Thanks. We'll work on scheduling that. We do have one other question here. Your line has been unmuted. Please state your name, company, and Hi, this is Elaine Ginocchio from the Western Interstate Energy Board. I just have a quick clarification question. On that last, the third bullet here on this slide, improved market incentives during tight supply conditions, um, I think you said it was part of some current initiative. Could you repeat what the name of the initiative is and where you are in terms of the progress on that initiative. Thanks. Sure. This is James, and I may have misspoke, but I, I meant to say that it's uh, going to take place in a planned initiative. Uh, that initiative name is scarcity pricing, and we plan to uh, sort of kick off that stakeholder process at the beginning of the year 2021. Okay, and just a clarification on that, are you also going to be including system market power mitigation in the scarcity pricing initiative? I think they somehow have gotten, um, well, I know why, they've gotten combined in conversations. Yeah, I'll have Brad clarify, but I, I, I believe that it is part of the scope that we're going to be considering any system market power changes in, in that initiative. Is that right, Brad? Uh, yeah, that's correct. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. At this time, I don't see any other any other questions. Great. Thanks so much, James. I believe our Greg will be covering the RA portion. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. This is Greg Cook. I will be covering the Areas of focus for resource adequacy in our roadmap. Uh, next slide, please. So we have several 
areas of reform that we are, are focusing on for resource adequacy. Uh, you know, particularly the current program is structured primarily off of meeting peak load. We think that that needs to be comprehensively changed as the system is evolving and that the RA framework must reflect not only peak load, but also energy needs are becoming critical, particularly as we're seeing storage resources replacing uh, much of the thermal plate. Um, operating reserves as well as imbalance reserves and as well as, and then the other thing that we found is obviously primary, of primary importance to us is not only meeting that gross peak but also being, ensuring that we have sufficient resources available to meet the net load peak as well. Um, next, we're also looking at uh, evolving some of the counting rules for resources to make sure that those resources are aligned, those counting rules are aligned with the operational contribution of the resource, and we think that's important to provide the proper resource valuation as well as to how we're counting resources and securing them for meeting resource adequacy needs. Um, we believe a portfolio assessment is important uh, reform that needs to be in place uh, to ensure that as the system is getting more complex, that the set of resources in the RA fleet um, can work together to support reliable operations, including meeting potential energy limitations going forward. Um, we also need to look at ensuring that planned outages do not impede our ability to maintain reliability. And last but not least, we need to collaborate with the CPUC to ensure that we have effective procurement of capacity to reliably operate the grid, and I think that's taking a look at do we have the proper reserve margins in place, and again, making sure that all the operational needs are met, not just meeting gross peak load. Uh, next slide, please. So within our resource adequacy enhancements, we have a number of items in there trying, looking to reform the resource adequacy program. First one is an unforced capacity requirement. This would replace our current um, resource adequacy availability incentive mechanism to provide resources incentives to maintain their availability. We believe this will provide a better accounting of resource capacity contributions that's based more on what they've historically uh, been available. Uh, looking at reforms to how we look at resource adequacy imports, we need to make sure that they specify actual physical resources that support that support those RA imports, uh, looking at enhancements to our planned outage process to ensure that we have sufficient capacity procured to cover expected planned outages. The portfolio assessment, as I talked about on the previous slide, again, this will ensure, help to ensure that the fleet can work together and not only meeting our net load peaks, but also our energy requirements as well. We need to look at uh, enhancing the must-offer obligations. We can't just have must-offer obligations. They're looking at ensuring that resources available over the system peaks. We need to make sure that the operational needs are met uh, 8,760 hours a year. Um, and then finally, looking at flexible resource adequacy, we really need to take a new look at that as well. Um, what we need the flexible resources to do is be able to meet those uh, uncertainty and ramping needs between the day ahead and real-time market. Um, so we're looking at resources that not only have that ability then that flexibility, but also have um, speed and have ramping speed so they're able to ramp more in a 15-minute time frame as opposed to the current three-hour uh, time frame that we're looking at under the current construct. And this will also have to be aligned with the new imbalance reserve product that we're developing to day ahead market enhancements. And finally, operationalizing storage. Storage, we're expecting to become a significant portion of our resource fleet going forward. So we need to ensure that we can efficiently dispatch those resources to meet our reliability needs given the energy limitations that come along with those leaf resources as well as uh, market limitations we may have for how they can be dispatched. So uh, next slide, please, Jimmy. So for our resource adequacy enhancements, this is a extremely large implementation effort for the ISOs. We've, we've split this into two phases. 
One phase that would be implemented in the fall of 2021, and then the phase two would come in a year later in the fall of 2022. Uh, for the 2021 implementation, we would be looking at putting in place the uh, new resource adequacy import provisions, also the planned outage process enhancements, some enhancements to how we do the local um, local studies um, with that would address some of the availability limited resource issues and how we would do CPMs regarding that. And finally, uh, operationalizing storage. And this is you know, something we've been looking at, implementing things like the minimum charge requirement to ensure that those storage resources will be available to meet those operational needs, particularly over the net load peak. And then coming in 2022, we would be putting in place the rest of the enhancements, including the unforced capacity counting, uh, the portfolio analysis, and we would also have some enhancements that would align the resource adequacy program with the new day ahead market enhancements that are expected to go in at that time as well. And that would include new must offer obligations and bid insertion rules, as well as the new um, construct for flexible resource adequacy. So that, with that, uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions on the resource adequacy uh, focus. And once again, press Greg. pound two if you have a question. And I have one question here. Hey, your line has been unmuted. Please go ahead. Yeah, hello. This is Ian White with Shell Energy. Is in part of the um, RA enhancements, if you could back up maybe to slide eight, um, one of the uh, topics we're looking at is RA import reform. Um, I was just wondering how much um, external um, transmission provider and BA uh, input you will be um, soliciting as part of this um, because the ISO really needs to uh, realize that um, any RA import changes must comply with other external entities transmission requirements and BA time timelines and this isn't just a change that that you know the ISO can unilaterally um, make without impacting other work streams and other external balancing authorities so so anytime you're dealing with RA import uh, or import resources it gets more complicated so it's just a long way of asking um, is the ISO going to be working to um, take feedback from external um, BAs and entities so as to minimize seams issues? Yeah, that's, we, we definitely are. I mean, just to be clear, this is an initiative that's been going on now for, I think, almost a year and a half, and we have been having, you know, very in-depth conversations with a lot of the external transmission providers to ensure that the policies are aligned with how they buy and sell transmission outside of the ISO and how that would work with the new RA import uh, construct that we're developing. So, yeah, the answer is yes, we, we have been, I guess, is the real answer, and we've continued to take, you know, significant input from those external entities and putting forward the design that we have uh, put in place so far, thus far in the initiative. Okay, thanks. And we've been part of the, just those discussions. So, yeah, perfect. Thanks for the clarification there. You bet. And once again, President Pound, too, do you have any questions? And I do not see any other questions at this time. Great. Thanks so much, uh, Operator and Greg. I believe the next step we have. Uh, Mr. Brad Cooper. Okay, thanks. Uh, okay, next slide, please. In this section, I'm going to talk about the uh, various uh, uh, market changes we're we're working on stakeholder plan to work on stakeholder processes processes to uh, address. Uh, first initiative here is the the day at market enhancements initiative. Uh, that's an ongoing in, an in, initiative. Uh, uh, the, the goal of this initiative is to uh, 
come up with a uh, dead market product that will improve market efficiency and price signals by uh, being co-optimized in the day ahead market as opposed to uh, the existing way our grid operators are addressing uh, the increased uncertainty between day ahead and real time, uh, which they're doing through uh, out of market actions such as uh, uh, additional luck adjustments or biasing the real time load forecast or, or exceptional dispatches. Uh, so we're working on uh, imbalanced reserves uh, that would be co-optimized. Uh, we had a, a stakeholder call a couple weeks ago, I think it was, where we described a modification we're going to propose where we're, we're going to uh, uh, modify our previous proposals and, and uh, go to a proposal where we, we preserve the existing RUC process, but uh, but enhance it to uh, to uh, better address uh, committing sufficient resources to uh, meet our demand forecast. Uh, um, and uh, like I said, the, the goal of all this is is to get get this uh, need for additional capacity for uncertainty between the day ahead and real time markets into the market, and and so it can be priced and reduce out of market actions. Uh, next slide, please. We're also working on extending the uh, day of market to EIN entities. Uh, this should provide a lot of uh, benefits, uh, improve market efficiencies by uh, producing hourly schedules for economic exchanges between entities in the West, uh, get a more optimal day ahead, uh, day ahead unit commitment, and then um, improve transmission utilization and uh, the dispatch of renewable resources across a, a broader footprint. Uh, again, this is a ongoing initiative. Uh, it's, it's been on a little bit of a, of a hold the last uh, few months because a number of people asked for additional time to consider uh, the situation last summer in, in their comments. We, we recently uh, received comments and, and uh, we'll be continuing this initiative uh, throughout next year. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, our approach in this initiative is to uh, break the policy development into what we're calling bundles, uh, you know, coming up with a way to extend the day ahead market to EIM entities without full integration into the, um, the uh, as, as ISO members where they're turning over transmission, et cetera, like a traditional members in an ISO slash RTA do. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a complex undertaking, so we're, we're breaking this up into these various bundles. We've been focused on the first bundle so far where we're looking at the, uh, what's called the resource sufficiency evaluation, how transmission would be provided to the EDAM, and then how, uh, uh, transfer revenue, which is revenue between, which is revenue due to uh, uh, congestion between BAAs, and then how congestion revenue, uh, these are kind of our terms of art, congestion revenue, which is congestion within BAAs, you know, how that would be allocated. And uh, once we wrap up that bundle, we would move on to the, the bundle two and the in the bundle three, which all also have uh, a lot of meaty topics. Next slide, please. We're also planning uh, what we're calling the uh, Dispatch Enhancements Initiative. It's going to look at uh, ways to improve the management of renewable resources in our market and in our grid operations. Uh, we want to look at things like uh, managing ramp rates to better control system balance. Uh, at, at least in the Cal ISO BAA, our, our grid operators experience challenges. Uh, for example, when when solar resources come off of curtailments and then they ramp very rapidly, and we can't readjust the rest of the dispatch to account for that. Uh, we we also want to look at uh, market incentives 
for resources to provide uh, more accurate curtail, re curtail response in response to our dispatch and prices. Um, and then we also want to address uh, uh, a couple of uh, decremental or, or, or downward dispatch issues. Uh, we want to look at um, decremental market power, which is kind of the opposite problem of, um, of uh, incremental energy market power. You take everything and turn it around, and that's that's decremental market power. It's it's when it's when resources have a day ahead schedule or a or a base schedule, and then they can they they can potentially exert market power on the price they pay or get paid to get dispatched down. Uh, and we also want to uh, clarify the settlement settlement rules for uh, in the Calico BAA. A decremental exceptional dispatches. Uh, there's there's some current issues with those settlement rules that have existed for some time, and as, as decremental exceptional dispatches become more important, it's, it's important to clarify those. And then uh, we, you know we'll get stakeholder input at the beginning of this initiative and, and potentially add um, other issues uh, or topics. Next slide, please. Uh, like James described previously, uh, last summer prompted us to uh, to uh, re to uh, prioritize a uh, scarcity pricing initiative. A lot of stakeholders have been asking for this recently. Uh, you know, we want to improve our scarcity pricing provisions to make sure we have efficient pricing during tight supply conditions. Uh, we also want to explore mechanisms to ensure real-time prices and incentivize accurate dead scheduling and bidding that aligns with operational needs during tight supply conditions. For example, when our prices get very near the bid cap or at the bid cap in the day ahead market, uh, there can be issues with um, virtual supply because under our current pricing provisions, you know, the, the real-time prices can't go much higher than the, than the day end prices. So that, that kind of provides uh, not optimal incentives for for uh, those kinds of bids. Um, and then as part of this, we also want to look at the relationship of a scarcity market design to our, our system market power mitigation proposals and then our per quarter 831 designs. Per quarter 831 raises the bid cap to $2,000 under certain conditions if if uh, costs indicate uh, prices are above $1,000 uh, were, were uh, uh, going to be proposing to FERC some, some modifications to our FERC order 831 compliance filing uh, that have to do with uh, 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 pricing um, Pricing imports and, and how we set our uh, power balance constraints and the rest of the market parameters uh, relative to the submitted bid costs. And uh, so we're, we're going to have to look at the scarcity pricing design to see its, its relationship uh, with those topics. Uh, you know, we sent out a communication last week where where we said we were going to hold off on our system market power mitigation proposal that we were originally going to take to our board in December, uh, but we want to take a little bit more time to look at that in relationship to what happened last summer and, to, and in relationship to potential scarcity of pricing improvements before uh, we move forward with that. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, uh, another initiative we'll be taking on, this will be uh, later in the year, and this is something that uh, we've talked about for a while uh, with stakeholders, uh, the uh, frequency response initiative. Uh, this will examine mechanisms for the CalISO BAA to keep meeting its NERC and WEC frequency response requirements. Uh, we'll look at uh, additional mechanisms to continue to meet those requirements. Currently, we're meeting those requirements by 
by uh, uh, basically purchasing frequency response capability from other VAAs. Uh, that's what we're referring to in this slide as a transferred frequency response. Uh, you know, potentially we'll continue that. Uh, potentially, you know, we could look at a frequency response sharing group. And of course, we will look at a, a frequency response product in the market. Then in conjunction with this, we'll look at regulation product enhancements, which is, which is, uh, related to frequency response, though, though they, they, they are somewhat different. Uh, we'll look at uh, enhancements to our, our our, what's called our current pay for performance regulation product, and then also look at uh, enhancements to our minimum performance criteria for, for providing regulation in our, in our regulation certification process. Next slide, please. Oh, and, and that's it for the, the, the market uh, and market policy development. I'd be happy to take any questions. Once again, pressing pound two if you wish to ask a question. I do have two questions in the queue. No one's been unmuted, please go ahead. Yeah, hi again, Ian White with Shell Energy. Um, I think it's slide maybe 13 or 14. Um, uh, when we were looking at, um, yeah, this one, 14 here. Um, uh, dispatch Enhancement Initiative. Um, third bullet point, explore solutions to mitigate decremental market power. Question is, has the ISO demonstrated that de decremental market power is a problem, either ISO or DMM? Um, it, it just seems like the, the, you know, these market power initiatives, whether it's system market power or, or potentially exploring this, um, this is a, sort of a, uh, a, a cure in, in, in search of a disease, because I, I'm, I'm, I may be misinformed, but I'm unaware that uh, either ISO or DMM have maintained that at least decremental market power is an, is an issue, and uh, just um, wanted to ask that question. Thanks. Uh, yeah, good question. Um, I'm not recalling offhand if, if we have published anything about decremental market power. Uh, uh, this is an, it is an issue that our DMM has raised to us, at, at least internally. It's a little bit, it's a, you know, it's, it's a little bit different than system market power that, you know, that, that, you know that's, I guess, could be debatable whether, whether we, can have market power at the system level. The decremental market power is just another variation of local market power, which I don't think anyone argues that there's the potential for for uh, local market power. So you, you could have you can have decremental market power just as um, easily as you can uh, incremental market power. And you know certainly in the um, in the in the past, in the in our, in our prior market, when we before we went to the normal market, we, we we did have instances of you know there was the that back then it was the infamous debt game. So so we did have we did have decremental market power at least in the old market. But uh, that's a good question, good point, and uh, that's something we can look at when we uh, when we start this initiative, some kind of quantification of the extent of the issue or potential issue. Yeah, that, yeah that'd be this, good. Well, uh, I well just, this is Greg Cook. Yeah, I, I would add on to it. Yeah, I mean, it's not necessarily, you know, this roadmap is looking forward. We're not looking backward. And we are expecting, you know, the continuing evolution of the grid fleet where we're having, you know, we're moving to 40, 60, 100% uh, RPS standards that you know, we're expecting this to become a much more significant issue as we go forward than it has been in the past. And that's going to be a combination of having, you know, significantly more renewables on the fleet as well as relying a lot on storage resources as well um, to meet the operational needs. So, you know, it's we're trying to be proactive in where we see the market going. Uh, Follow-up question. Um, when we say decremental market power, are, are, we, are we then talking about decremental market power at a local level or like decremental market power more at like a system level or even in like AS markets? 
I, 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 I guess it could be either, but I, I think it, it, it's a more acute issue at the, uh, at the uh, local level. And then, um, you know, we also want to, we also want to look at this in conjunction with proposed changes. You know, the second bullet, enhanced market incentives for resources to provide accurate curtailment response. You know, so one thing we could potentially look at is changing the bid floor so we can get, uh, you know, more negative bids lower than the current uh, bid floor of um, minus 150, I think it is. And, it, when you do that, though, that 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 then uh, makes the issue. If, if we're going to do that, that would make the issue of decremental market power more of an issue. Right. Okay. Yep. Thank you. And we do have one other question here. Your line has been unmuted. Please go ahead. Hey, Brad. Hey, Greg. Uh, Dan Williams from Customized Energy Solutions. So staying on the uh, dispatch enhancements initiative, um, I think when the first round of the 2021 catalog came out and maybe a little bit before that, too, we were talking about having um, removal of the TAC export fee and uplift charges as part of the scope of this initiative. And then I think it, that got de-scoped um, moving into, I don't know, the, the revised catalog. And I'm just curious if you think that's still something that uh, maybe should be considered in scope, um, potentially thinking if it was de-scoped because of uh, the direction that DAME or EDAM were going in, if maybe anything's changed with that, and it might be good to um, bring that back into the scope, at least at the uh, start of the initiative. Yeah, this is Brad. I, I... I believe our thinking of why we took it out of there is we thought that that was a better fit for uh, EDAM, which is which is looking more comprehensively on, on transmission compensation. Okay. Um, and then the other question that I had was uh, just on EDAM. Um, just kind of high level, what, what are the next steps there uh, following the, the comments that came in a, a couple weeks ago? Are we, should we expect like a comments matrix and then some discussion maybe of uh, integration with Dane after that, after the Dane proposal comes out or kind of how do you maybe envision the next couple months of, of EDAM happening? Yeah, internally, over the next um, month or two, we're trying to, you know, we have a we have a day, a day of market enhancements paper scheduled to come out um, next month. Uh, we're trying to focus our efforts on day of market enhancements right now and get that get out our our uh, next paper on that, uh, you know, as soon as we can, uh, you know, because that's that's the uh, the basis for EDAM. Um, yeah, I don't. I don't recall, or I, I'm not sure that we've discussed what our next uh, deliverable on EDAM is going to be. It, it would either be a, a stakeholder comments matrix, or uh, I, I. I don't think it's going to be a, a revised proposal yet. We, we may well uh, organize some. Uh, Workshops and, and or some other conversations uh, to uh, try and get better alignment on uh, perspectives for EDAM first because there's, there's kind of a uh, a significant difference in the views of how EDAM should be structured between the, the California utilities and uh, the current EIM participants. Great. Yeah, um, this is great. Yeah, I think, sounds great. Yeah, I would just uh, add on to what Brad was saying. I think that's that's our plan is that you know we would be taking in the, the comments that just came in and then coming out with a with a couple of workshops and probably I would think the timing of those would be early next year is when we would have hold those workshops. Um, and you know, as Brad said, that will allow us to focus on that next iteration of the day ahead market enhancements um, proposal, which will be coming out uh, early in December. 
Great. Thank you. Appreciate the updates there. At this time, I don't see any further questions. All right. Thanks so much. Uh, thanks, Brad. And I believe Joe Powers is up now to discuss the DER section. Yep. Hi. Thank you, Jimmy. <clears throat> and yes, um, this section is really going to um, focus on the efforts that will be doing um, on that third roadmap driver, the new technologies and continued work on integration of these new technologies um, and the replacement of the capabilities that other, our current fleet of resources um, have provided. Um, so the first being uh, FERC Order 2222 compliance, fairly new one that has popped up here at the end of the year. So the ISO does plan to do a com comprehensive gap analysis on that order, specifically against what we have available today under the current dis distributed energy resource provider provisions uh, that have been in place since 2016. So we're going to work on this uh, this first quarter of 2021. There is a compliance filing to this order that is due on July 19th in 2021. So this will be falling within that time frame to determine what it is that we need to do uh, to fully comply with the order. The actual deployment of any ch changes that we identify in this gap analysis, that's to be determined. We don't have specifically uh, uh, outlook as to when those would need to be, when we could complete uh, the full compliance activities necessary. So we've been looking just initially at what this might entail. We definitely know that we will need to reduce the current size requirement from 500 kW down to 100 kW. We're also looking at maybe there's some address adjustments in our aggregation and metering requirements specifically to accommodating demand response in a distributed energy resource aggregation and demand response measured through a baseline. And, current, and the, the final one that we're looking at is, is really about resolving potential settlement impacts on the broader definition of these types of mixed aggregations that's inclusive of demand reduction or demand response. Okay, next slide. Next slide. In terms of the efforts that we're going to take with regards to our normal, what we've been doing for several years, our energy storage and distributed energy resource initiatives, we're going to take a breather. We're going to really look at what we are implementing as well as what we have implemented, specifically in the most re recent ESDER initiative. Uh, the functionalities that we're introducing in 2021 as well as 2022, just evaluating how useful they've been, how effective, how they're being used, and really looking at that functionality and identifying any gaps that may remain uh, what we have introduced with those initiatives and even previous initiatives. And then based on that evaluation, start looking at what we might want to start uh, uh, new enhancements for and, and what we might be looking at uh, for initiatives down the road. But really for the next few years, it's more of a review and evaluation. And we're going to con continue our focus on operationalizing distributed energy resource. This will go hand in hand with what we're doing on for quarter 22-22 compliance. Really looking at enhancing internally what we have from for uh, distributed energy resources systems and, and the tools available, as well as looking at ways we can gain greater visibility to these type of resources and enhancing our forecasting based on this visibility and just overall oper operationalizing energy storage and these distributed energy resources. We can go to the next slide. The, this, uh, what we are planning to do as an extension to the work that we did on ESDER 4 
and looking at an alternative qualifying capacity methodology for develop value, valuation of demand response using an um, effective load carrying capability and really doing some additional uh, rerun of the ELCC study that was prepared under uh, ESDER 4 by E3. And this study explored how we would apply, how this could be done, an ELCC methodology for demand response, specifically given its variable output nature, um, its limitations, and really get, getting down to how these these variability and limitations would affect a, a, an, evalu an evaluation of its capacity valuation um, for loss of load. We plan to take this study, this actual updated study, which is in the works right now, and this updated study is based on feedback, again, that we got from our ESDER 4 initiative and taking some of the feedback from that making some adjustments and changes, rerunning the study. Um, so we'd like to take those results, and, and, and this was something that we had always planned to do under ESDA 4, is to take the results and submit them into uh, the RA proceedings, specifically in the Track 3B. In addition, we'd like to be very transparent as to the efforts that we've done in ESDA 4, as well as what we're proposing under Track 3B of the RA proceedings and get this in front of our demand response stakeholders. And so we're going to do some additional sharing, have begun to share, and we'll continue to share this information with the DREMIC committee members. And the time frame around this is to evaluate, uh, get this out there, and uh, really evaluate and de develop this methodology for the assessment of demand response within the within 2021 for RA year 2022. So that's kind of the time frame around all of this effort for ELCC. Next one. Again, this is a generalized uh, effective use, value, and treatment of all of distributed energy uh, resources as well as energy storage resources. Uh, really working more, again, evaluating and working more with our local regulatory authorities uh, to continue to enhance and develop these policies needed for full integration of the distributed energy resources into the market. We've been walk, uh, working in, in steps with our uh, with the CTUC as well as other authorities uh, to, to get these integrated into the market, to get them accessible uh, to the market operations. Um, and so we're just going to continue in those efforts. Within California, we're going to coordinate with the CTUC and the CEC on, again, this demand response valuation, as well as some other standards that are coming into play for load management. Uh, we're going to do that work under resource adequacy and, and developing the resource adequacy rules specifically, specifically to these type of resources, um, and also looking at the load modification side in, uh, in addition to the supply side of these DER resources and the rules associated with that. And again, with respect to the, just the con comprehensive review of the efforts that we have done in the ESDER initiative to continue to refine, to look at what we have in place under our BPMs and our tariff provisions and, uh, with respect to must offer obligation, with respect to the rules under resource adequacy, and currently under the ESDER um, 4 initiative with our default energy bids. Um, and really just kind of refining what we have uh, in terms of the provisions for these. And the next one. Lastly, there's going to be a lot of effort uh, with regard to hybrid resource evolution. And there is ongoing development of the uh, hybrid resources. There's a lot of expectation of any of these coming online and the next three years, so we're going to put a lot of effort into this as we have already done so in 20, uh, 2020 as well as 2021. 
um, some of the areas that we're planning to do, work on and with respect to an uh, additional initiative is uh, focused on market power mitigation, um, some of the resource adequacy must offer obligation rules, and additional functionality, additional to what we're already doing with the current hybrid initiative and, and those efforts that will be coming into play in this month, next month, as well as in spring of 2021, as, and then fall of 2021 as well. Um, but also looking at what we may need to do in terms of consideration of additional operational uh, functionality based on operational experience that we're starting to see with the hybrid resources in 2020, 2021. And I think that might be the last one for my section, or is there another? I think you're right. We can move on. Yeah. 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 So that's it for section on the integration of distributed energy resources. Any questions? I do have one question here on the line, and just a reminder, pressing pound two if you wish to ask a question. If your line has been unmuted, please go ahead. Hi, Jill. This is Christine Kirsten. I have a question on behalf of Pacific Corps. Um, if you could go okay. back to slide 18, please. There we go. Work order. So, the, um, so on the part where you're saying that you're in, uh, the deployment of the changes uh, in the compliance filing, I know they're to, to be determined. Um, but as far as adjusting um, the aggregation and metering requirements, um, are, are you, is TISO considering um, as part of this initiative um, to include, like, um, to include uh, those kinds of, ag you know, aggregation and um, metering requirement changes uh, with respect to integrating EIM entities into, the D into DR participation? I think that um, has to be part of the overall comprehensive analysis. Um, it may, um, it may or may not be. Um, we may or may not have a specific initiative on this. Our, our goal is to be compliant with the FERC order. That's the number one goal. Um, but there may be some parallel efforts that we'll have to take in terms of how this might affect EIM participation for DER aggregation. Um, specifically, though, I, I, no specific uh, initiative around this, um, really just an analysis of the compliance to the order. Um, but I, I hear what you're saying. I know that there is a desire for DER aggregations, participation in EIM. So definitely would be looking at that in parallel to this. Okay. Thanks, Jill. And at this time, I don't see any other questions. Thank you. Thanks, Jill. And I believe it's back to Greg for the final section. Okay, bringing it home. This is the roadmap and annual plan. Uh, next slide, please. So I wanted to start with just showing that, you know, there's a very strong connection among the resource adequacy enhancements, the day ahead market enhancements, and extending the day ahead market to EIM entities. And that connection has been a large driver of the three-year roadmap, all of those related interdependencies. And the way that the, the interdependencies work is that we have the resource adequacy enhancements need to be coordinated with that new um, resource efficiency evaluation that will go into the extended day ahead market, which would then all feed into the day ahead market, which would be used to co-optimize all of those regional capacity resources that are coming not only from the ISO's uh, RA program, but is also from the, the EDAM participants through their integrated resource plans. And so all that capacity would then be co-optimized in the day-ahead markets, which would then drive that new real-time must-offer obligation at, that would go into the EIM resource efficiency evaluation 
which would ultimately run into the the real time market. So I think it's you know it's important to see how those policy development um, efforts all need to be strongly coordinated to have a you know comprehensive way of working market as we go forward. Uh, next slide, please. We also wanted to point out there's a number of initiatives that are not on this 2021 roadmap that were included in last year's roadmap. Um, the first is the system market power mitigation phase two. So this was the um, next phase of looking at system market power, which we've been looking at applying it to the day ahead market. We got a number of stakeholder comments that this would best be developed within the construct of the EDAM design. So we have moved it to uh, expand the scope of EDAM to also include looking at how we might do system market power mitigation. Uh, next, we have removed, we had a placeholder in last year's roadmap for congestion revenue rights, track two. If you recall, um, track, we had two initiatives in track one, track 1A and 1B. Those were designed primarily to deal with some auction, CRR auction efficiency issues that have been raised um, by our Department of Market Monitoring. Uh, we implemented those first, uh, those track one initiatives and we wanted to see whether how effective those were in addressing the problems. In the event that they were insufficient, then we would move forward with a track two to look at uh, additional changes to the CRR market. But what we found is uh, given the uh, market performance to date, we've seen a significant increase in auction efficiency as a result of those policy changes from track one. I think we've seen the auction efficiency go up from approximately 30% up to close to 80% now. So given that, we, we no longer think that we need to prioritize uh, a track to um, congestion revenue rights initiative. You know, we'll be continuing to monitor the performance of those markets and making enhancements as necessary, but we no longer feel the need to um, reserve a, a large portion of our roadmap for, for that effort. Uh, next, the commitment costs and default energy bid enhancements phase two. Um, so the ISO is implementing phase one uh, at the end of this year, and we do believe that that addresses you know, probably the vast majority of the reforms that stakeholders were looking for and giving them more flexibility to accurately provide their costs uh, to the ISO. Um, phase two would have introduced market bidding and market power mitigation. And that's still something that we're, we're looking to do, but we think it's prudent at this time to um, take a pause, see how the phase one um, enhancements work, and make sure that uh, once we have the more uh, certainty on what the EDAM and DAD market designs are going to look like, that the um, proposed phase two changes would also be um, consistent with those designs. So we're we're pulling that from the roadmap at this point, at least the implementation of that, the, the policy has already been developed. And then finally, the contingency modeling enhancements, um, you know, at a high level, this was establishing a new 30-minute reserve requirement into our market. Um, this was primarily focused at meeting um, some NERC standards, but those NERC standards uh, over the past couple of years have changed. So we would be, when well, we anticipated that we would be uh, applying the contingency modeling enhancements to a number of paths within the ISO system. It's now down to maybe a single path. And so given that, the, the potential benefits of this enhancement have significantly decreased from where they originally were. So we're now recommending pulling that, at least putting a pause on that, because this would also be a pretty big payload on our day ahead market optimizations. We want to make sure that, you know, we're prioritizing the use of that as well, and so that we're not perhaps foregoing the ability to do future enhancements by putting in um, enhancements that may have a large impact on that optimization but may not be providing a significant of benefits. So with that, uh, next slide, and we'll go into the what the three-year roadmap looks like. Um, you know, again, we're, we're continuing to look at, we're in a period of broad changes to our market structure which will continue over the next three years. Uh, the way this chart is read, the blue diamonds uh, depict the implementation timelines for the various initiatives. Uh, we do a 
large um, new release implementation each fall of each year, which is where those blue diamonds are lined up. And then the, the boxes depict the time for the policy development of the various initiatives. Again, if you want the what the scope of these initiatives are, those are all included in our stakeholder initiatives catalog. Um, but working down this, you can see we have a number of new enhancements that are going in this year and will continue over the next three years. Um, a couple of things I'll, I'll point out on here, we'll be implementing the flexible ramping product deliverability would then be going in place in the fall of 2021. And we're also looking at uh, the day ahead market enhancements continuing on into next year, um, as well as EDAM continuing on. We expect to be working on that policy development all of next year and potentially into 2022 as well with the ultimate implementation in the fall of 2023. So we'd be ready to onboard new participants uh, into the day ahead market in the spring of 2024. Um, SATA, that storage is a transmission asset. Um, that's something that we've delayed until 2022 to allow time for other policy development. We also wanted to have a lot of the um, energy storage and distributed energy resource enhancements put in place prior to that, as well as looking at developing market power mitigation mechanisms for storage resources, which we're also moving forward on. So we'll be looking at that in 2022. Um, frequency response measures, again, that's a new initiative we'll be taking on next year that Brad talked about, as well as the dispatch enhancements and scarcity pricing. So those are all new initiatives we'll be taking on next year. Uh, in the resource adequacy area, we'll be continuing on in the resource adequacy enhancements that we anticipate finishing in the earlier part of next year. We'll be taking on a new comprehensive initiative on maximum import capability enhancements. This was something that has been requested by a number of our stakeholders, so we have slotted that in for 2021. And then uh, joint own unit modeling um, initiative as well. There's a lot of resource owners out there that own uh, that resources that are jointly owned, and we'll be looking at additional functionality so that those resources can effective, effectively participate in our markets. And then finally, um, you know, as Jill said, on the distributed energy resource area, you know, we're taking a bit of a pause, as you can see, on new policy developments so we can focus more on implementation. We will be starting up the hybrid evolution initiative later next year. Again, once we have some experience with operating uh, the co-located resources. And then finally, we will be looking at uh, into the 2023 timeframe, considering how effective the current policy has been for the distributed energy resources and whether we need additional enhancements once we have a lot of the other policy development um, in our rear view mirror as well as a lot of the implementation. So with that, now you can go on to the annual plan. And so we have, I believe, 14, uh, 15 initiatives, I think, on the, on the annual plan for next year. Um, so again, you know, it's a very, um, busy plan as we're continuing through this period of rapid change. Uh, we have a couple of EIM initiatives um, up front, continuing the development of the EIM governance review. We expect to have that completed next year, as well as the sub-entity scheduling coordinator agreement, which will allow some additional functionality for EIM entities, uh, the RA enhancements, the MIC enhancements, um, and then, you know, the other I think I've talked about the rest of these outside of the demand prioritization. That was we had the workshop on that um, on Friday, which was looking at, you know, how do we, when we're in these tight or shortage conditions, how are we going to prioritize demand and exports? So we'll be looking at and seeing if there needs to be any policy changes on that prior to getting into the summer of 2021. Uh, in anticipation of continuing tight supply conditions. Um, and I think with that, we've covered pretty much everything else, so I will stop there and see if anybody has any questions on either the three-year roadmap or the annual plan. Once again, pressing pound two, if you wish to ask a question, pressing pound two on your telephone. And I do not see any questions coming in at this time. All right, Jimmy, I guess it's for you to take us home.
Great. Thanks so much, Greg, and to all the other presenters, of course, and James uh, for the team uh, presenting this information. Thank you as well for everyone joining uh, on a Monday uh, despite current events. Again, appreciate all that. As you can see, we are asking for comments uh, following the Thanksgiving break on December 7th. Uh, this will be according to the old uh, initiative submittal process. So when you go on the initiative page, you'll see that we're asking for comments to still be submitted to the initiative comments at kaiso.com mailbox. Uh, so appreciate that as we're working to convert uh, to the new tool. Uh, as mentioned, this was being recorded in MP4 format. Uh, look for the recording to be, of course, available in the next couple of business days. And with that, folks, please have a great rest of your day, and uh, thank you once more.